good morning. Good morning. If you would take your Bibles and look with me, we're going to look first here in Ezekiel chapter 14. If you would turn there, Ezekiel chapter 14. <clears throat> we're told, of course, the book of Ezekiel takes place during the captivity of the Jews, but we're told before the people, uh, the Jews were taken into captivity, we're told in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verses 15 and 16 that the sins which they had committed had grown to such a point. They had rejected God. They had rejected the messengers of God. They had refused the word of God. You remember Jeremiah saying in Jeremiah 6 and verse 10 that the word of God was an object of scorn to them. You remember in the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 10, Hosea would say that God had hewn the people by the prophets. He had tried his best to break them down and to reform them from their calloused hearts into the heart which he desires, which is a contrite heart. You see that in Psalm 51 and verse 19. He had done his best, but it tells us in 2 Chronicles 35 and verses 15 and 16, it tells us that their sin had grown to the point in which there was no remedy. They had to go into captivity. They had to be punished for their sins, their multitude of sins, which if we wanted to take and fill up a notebook full of all the sins that the people of, of God in that day were committing, we would fill it. We would have no trouble filling it. There was all sorts of things, abuses of power. There was idolatry. There was covetousness. There was sexual immorality. There was, and the list continues. Of sin after sin. Sin even, it tells us in Amos chapter 4, sin among the people uh, and sin among the priests. It tells us in Amos chapter 4 that as they, that is the people, increase, so did their sin, the sin of the priests, increase. And the priests were using the people as a, as a bit of a profiting, uh, a profiteering type of thing where they would encourage sin among them so that they would come and offer the right sacrifices and they would gain from those sacrifices. The sins of Israel, uh, the sins of Judah are innumerable and they're great and they boil down to one thing and that's what we want to talk about. You look here in Ezekiel 14 verse 14, a very different picture from what I just described is given here in Ezekiel 14 and verse 14. We've made mention of this as we've gone through our study, our study of the book of Job, it says there in verse 14, it says, even as if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, talking about in the world, among the people of Israel, they would deliver but their own lives by their righteousness, declares the Lord God. They would only be able to save themselves. That's what he's saying there. There would be... The, the sins of the people were so innumerable and so great that even intercessory prayers by these three godly men would be of no effect, would be of no use. God wouldn't listen to the intercessory prayer. He would have made up his mind, I am going to send them into captivity. I will destroy them. That is what I intend to do. Now there's a big picture a big contrasting picture that is drawn here of these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job. And as we think about these three men, there's a lot of qualities that we could bring out and we could recognize that each one of these share with one another and, and which are so worthy of our, uh, of our following. You have their righteousness. You have their faith. You have all the actions that they would do in order to please God. You have innumerable things that we could get up and we could talk about with these three men that are shown. But the one we want to talk about is integrity. Integrity is the base quality that makes these men different from Israel. Integrity is the quality of being whole and being unmixed, of having no divided allegiance. It is being fully grounded upon a moral standard. It is having moral uprightness. When we talk about a man of integrity, we're talking about a man who is sown to and is restricted by his moral principles, who in, a, in an opportunity to go against him say, no, I will not do that because that goes against who I am. That goes against 
who I attempt to be. That's integrity, and that's what the people of Israel lacked. The book of Ezekiel gives a big, very descriptive picture of that. On numerous accounts, Ezekiel 16, for instance, you have it there in Ezekiel 16, the picture of God finding the Israelites as as an unwanted child is the is the picture there all bloody and covered in dirt and he takes them and he cleans them up he nurses them to health he watches them grow he takes them to be his bride and then they immediately go and they participate in infidelity and though they participate in infidelity he says no come back to me and they come back and they they get right because the the spouse they went off to abuses them and then they go no you know what i want to go right back into infidelity so they go and take someone else and that other person is going to use them and abuse them they're going to come back to god and eventually gets to the point where god says that's enough and all of that behavior has to do with a lack of integrity a lack of integrity integrity is a quality of godliness. It is a quality of godliness. And as much as as much as it is displayed in these three men, it ought to be displayed in us. Uh, these three men serve as examples of how to maintain integrity during different tests, different trials. Uh, you have Noah, who is going to be the the focus of our thoughts today, he is going to present for us the example of how to maintain integrity in a godless world. It is godliness amid godlessness. And we're going to look there in Genesis 6 at this, and we'll uh, make some comments concerning this, uh, both this morning and this evening. As we think about integrity, it's important for us to realize that where integrity is lacking, sin is abundant. And that's what we see here in Genesis 6. Look there. Genesis 6, verses 1 through 8, you have the, the picture of the world before it was destroyed by the flood. And there's a big contrast from verses 1 through 7 and then into verse 8. And we can continue reading, but we're only going to read that. But if we continue reading, we're going to see even more contrast. Uh, being developed between the world and Noah. It says there in verse 1, look at this. When man began to multiply on the face of the world, on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and afterwards when the sons of God came and the daughters of man, and they bore children to them, these were, uh, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. So he's giving you an insight into how the corruption of the world began. And that was you had godly men going after ungodly women. Verse 5, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of thoughts, uh, every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and he grieved him into his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man from, uh, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. <clears throat> there is a stark contrast, even in these eight verses, that is displayed between the world and Noah. And if we continue reading uh, all the way from chapter 6 into chapter 7, what we're, we're going to see is there's much more uh, to the picture. For instance, in our limited view of the picture thus far, we have it that the world had evil intentions. That's what the world was set on. That's what the world desired to do. We understand that this is among the list of the six things that the Lord hates, seven of which are abomination, Proverbs 6, 17 through 19. It says there, hearts that devise evil and feet that run to commit them. That's what the people uh, were, were intending upon. Whereas you have Noah 
as the, as the opposite, you'll see this in verse 9, that Noah was righteous and blameless and he walked with God. You have it that the world grieved God in chapter 6 and verse 6, but Noah found favor with God, chapter 6 and verse 8. The world was destroyed by God, chapter 6 and verse 7. Noah was rescued by God, chapter 7 and verse 1. The world was seen as corrupt by God, chapter 6 and verse 11. Noah was seen as righteous by God, chapter 7 and verse 1. The world was disobedient to Noah, chapter 6 and verse 22, or chapter 6 and verse 12, rather. And Noah was obedient to God, chapter 6 and verse 22. The point is this, Noah lived amid a world saturated with ungodliness, and yet he maintained righteousness. Peter tells us concerning Noah in uh, 2 Peter 2 and verse 5 that he was a herald of righteousness, which indicates that even before the time of the flood, before receiving the warning concerning the events which were to take place, that Noah was a spokesperson of God. Uh, uh, Peter would identify that earlier in one of his earlier writings in 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 19 and 20 that Noah was in every respect the spirit of Christ proclaiming repentance, rebuking sin in the midst of a wicked and corrupt generation. When we look at Noah, we see a man of integrity. That's what he's being saved for is integrity because integrity lies at the base of all of this. We can have our allegiances, we can claim our allegiances, but the only way that that's going to be shown it's going to be shown where we align ourselves is whenever our integrity is challenged. And Noah had stood the test. Noah had lived in such a way that the rest of the world, and we can't undermine this point, the rest of the entire world was destroyed. And he and his family were saved. Every other person but those who were on that boat perished in sin. Noah did not. It has to do with integrity. And there's three things that an integrity like Noah demands. I'm sure we could think of more, but three things. And uh, what we want to do today is we want to talk about the first this morning, and we'll come back this evening and talk about the second and the third. The first thing that is demanded to have an integrity like Noah's is to speak the truth amid lies. We have to speak the truth amid lies. Now, it's important for us to recognize this. Obviously, we have a very limited window into what the world was like whenever Noah was living and what type of world it was that he was rebuking. Our minds might begin to wonder what type of sins were the people engaged in. We might wonder what type of sins warranted a destruction of the whole world? I think that's a, that's a reasonable question. I think we might even begin to wonder what type of words did Noah use to rebuke his generation? We're probably a little bit fascinated by all of those things, about what the world was like. But here's the thing. We're, despite our limited view of the world, here's what we understand that it wasn't much different from it is, from how it is today. Because man's not much different. <clears throat> There's not a whole lot of variety with man. We're told in Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 9, there is nothing new under the sun that pertains to sin, that pertains to sinful desire, that, that pertains to man and the wickedness that he commits. You know, sin is sin and sinners are sinners. And it might be the truth that men devise new, different ways to commit sin. Uh, but it is not the truth that there is a new spirit of rebellion. That rebellious spirit has always remained the same. There's that common heart of rebellion, that common origin of pleasure, that common defense of constructed laws. You know... Man, they try to justify their sins. Man tries to uh, escape 
judgment, man tries to construct different lies so as to make whatever it is that they are doing less offensive and even in some cases in their eyes morally right. Uh, man will propose any sort of idea in order to excuse themselves from any sense of accountability and any adherence to some sort of standard other than what they have decided. There have been a plethora of lies that have been constructed so that men would feel fine about the sins which they commit. We see that in our world today. I strongly believe that was the case in his world today, or in his world that day. If a man, think about this, nothing new, right? So if a man wants to be amenable to God's law of morality, they want to have their own law of morality, <coughs> Well, there's different lines that can be constructed for that. Different ideas that can be presented. Some people are going to deny the presence of a moral lawgiver. They might claim that God is a creator. They might claim that there is a, a higher intelligent being who has designed the universe and so forth. But he has not instilled in man any sense of morality. There's no moral lawgiver. And since there's no moral lawgiver, some would say that there is no universal standard. A lack of a universal standard uh, would present nothing but chaos, and they're fine with that. Or at least so they claim they're fine with that until they experience it. They will deny a moral lawgiver. They will deny a universal standard. They will even begin to suggest something like subjective morality. The idea that you can determine your own sense of morality and it is then immoral, which is contradictive. It is immoral to enforce your sense of morality upon someone else. Um, there's a lot of different ways that man can, skate, uh, can try to skate by any sense of accountability. Uh, you have it that if a man wants to be excused from God's sexual laws, he will create all sorts of lies in order to support that. You have that to be the case with homosexuality. You have that to be the case with even pedophilia, transgenderism, and just in the same line as all those, hypersexuality. You have a variety of men who claim that they can lay with men, women who believe they can lay with women, people who believe that they can lay with multiple partners. They will all try to argue these very same actions from the very same argument, and that is, we derive from animals. It's an evolutionary argument. I heard a man that believed that you could, a man could have multiple partners, but a woman could not. And he argued it from the case of the animal kingdom. I heard the same thing from a woman who argued that she could have multiple partners, but a man could not. She argued it from the animal kingdom. Um, there are all sorts of different constructed lies that people can formulate in order to excuse that behavior, or so excuse that behavior. Some will even go beyond and they'll say, well, because of trauma, because this has happened to me, I therefore can do this. They allow for some sort of bad that has been done to them to excuse the bad which they are committing against God. You have it that if a man wants to be free from any sense of accountability to God, that he will suggest ideas like deism. Deism is the belief that God uh, does exist and that God is intelligent, that God is the creator of the universe, and that he did create and fashion man, and he put man upon the earth, and he set everything in motion and then let it start and walked away from it and doesn't want any part of it. It's the idea that essentially God is a watchmaker. He comes and he makes a watch according to his own liking, his own specifications, his own desires. And then once that is constructed, he goes and makes another one. That's the idea there. And so people will say that that's how God exists, and so they would be free from any sort of accountability. Some people go a step further with the evolutionary argument 
and they deny a designer at all. They, they would rather suggest that we have our point of origin in randomness and chaos. And as such is the case, or if such is the case, they would say, uh, we therefore have no accountability to a higher being. The list can continue about how carnal man uh, seeks to justify their sinful behaviors through complex webs of lies. The righteous, however, the righteous ones of God, they do no such thing. The righteous ones of God, it's very simple. They herald the truth. They speak the truth. And they do it in unapologetic fashion. In unapologetic fashion. Understand this. The righteous of God, the, the men and women of integrity whose allegiance is fully committed over to God, they are unmixed by the world. They seek the truth. They're not moved by society. Society does not determine what quote unquote truth they're seeking. Society does not determine how publicly they seek it. Society does not determine any of that. God determines that. Those who are his, they walk. It tells us Psalm 1 and verse 1, not in the way of sinners. They're not abiding in the same course. They're not with them. They're not going to speak the same things. They're not going to seek the same things. Rather, here's what they, they say. The righteous ones of God, they exclaim all your commandments are truth. Psalm 119 and verse 51. They plead to God, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. <clears throat> and I will keep it to the end. Psalm 119 and verse 33. In unapologetic fashion, they speak the truth. Again, unmoved by society, not caring what the opinion of others is, only concerned with what God thinks about them. They speak the truth. They do not revert. They do not change. They do not modify. They speak the truth. They say, this is what the Lord has said concerning this. And they do it in whatever audience, whatever setting. It's not going to be partial. It's not going to matter who is who is uh, being entertained as the audience. In Psalm 119, in verse 46, the psalmist said, I will also speak your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame. I'm going to share it even to the people who other people, they're not going to share an unwelcomed opinion or an unwelcomed word. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to do what the society is afraid to do. And I'm not going to be ashamed to do it. And we see that type of spirit with John the Baptist. John the Baptist in Luke 3 and verse 19, he went and rebuked Herod the Tetrarch and said, you have taken your brother's wife. He's rebuking him of a marriage that he is not supposed to be involved in, a marriage that he needs to repent of, and it ends up costing his life. But John speaks as he is to speak, which is according to the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4. And verse 11, he is unashamed. He will not slip back. He is not going to change his words because of who he is in front of. Sometimes we change our speech because we're afraid to hurt somebody's feelings. Sometimes we change our speech because we're afraid of the type of looks we will receive. Sometimes we change our speech because we're afraid of the type of thoughts that will be produced in other people's minds. We're afraid of maybe what type of actions are going to be reciprocated to us. We're afraid of a number of things. And really, the thing we need to think about whenever we're speaking is, is what I'm going to say going to make me afraid on the day of judgment? That's what we need to be thinking about. We know that every deed's going to be held up in judgment, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, but we must also remember that every word is going to be held in judgment. A man of integrity doesn't have to worry about that. 
Men of integrity doesn't have to worry about standing before God and answering the question of, why do you lie to these people whenever they ask you if what they were doing was sinful? You don't have to answer the question of, why would you say this whenever they're out of the room and not when they're in the room? There's no questions you have to answer. If you're a man of integrity, you're doing what Noah did. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He rebuked the actions of his generation. That means as a man of integrity, a herald of righteousness, a preacher, he was unmixed with any affiliation to the world. And he spoke the truth. He spoke what God thought concerning the matter. And he spoke it regardless of the response he was going to receive. As Paul instructed Timothy, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and sound teaching. So Noah did. In season, out of season did not matter. You want to hear it, you don't want to hear it, it does not matter. It's accepted, it's unaccepted, it does not matter. You're going to reject it, it does not matter. There's an obligation to speak. There's an obligation to preach. And he did it. Because he's a man of integrity. Your integrity is going to be measured by a lot of things. Some of those things we'll talk about this evening. But your integrity first begins to be measured by the words you speak. The question we need to think about is, are the words we speak, are they from God or are they from man? <clears throat> the world practices godlessness. And as a result, the world speaks in such a way as to justify themselves, to justify their actions, to justify their intentions. And for those who belong to God, that is not so. For those who belong to God, they seek the truth. For those who belong to God, they speak the truth. For those who belong to God, their complete allegiance is to the truth giver and his words. They are unmixed in their allegiance. They are fully devoted to him. And they are fully devoted to his word. We're reminded of James 4 and verse 4. James said, Oh, you adulterous people, do not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. It makes you an enemy of God to side with the world. And it would be an awful thing if we began to side with the world in the things which we say. Because that is going to flow into further things. And that's going to be the, the outpouring of even greater serious things. Some things which we'll talk about this evening like our works and our wants, our desires. Uh, these are all things that need to be considered whenever we think about integrity. Nonetheless, Noah provides for us a great example that we need to follow. Noah was willing to stand against the uh, teachings and the lies of his generation and to share the truth of God's word, to seek it above all things, to hold it and to treasure it and to be pleased by it, delight in it, and to follow it. I pray sincerely that we do the same things ourselves. <clears throat> this morning, we want to offer an invitation for those who are here. We want to offer an invitation to those who need a study, those who need prayer, those who are wanting to know more about being a Christian. We would love to help you in whatever way we can. Concerning being a Christian, we want to tell you what our Lord said. Our Lord said in Matthew 10 and <clears throat> verse 33 that you have to confess him. If you're going to confess him, then he will confess you to the Father. He said in Luke 13 and verse 3 that you need to repent. You need to repent of your sins or you'll perish. He says in Mark 16 and verse 16 that you need to believe in him and be baptized. Those things are necessary to enter into a relationship with him to receive the complete blessings that he has to offer you. You have to remain faithful to the end, Matthew 10 and verse 22. Once you do that, you receive every single blessing that he's ever offered. That's all yours if 
you come to him and you stay with him and you hear him, you follow him, he will give you life. Uh, at this time, if there's anybody who has a need of the congregation, come and make that known. It's going to be stand as we sing. Oh, your sins be a song.